to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Jesse. What up, dog? Wait. All right. I mean, hi. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> Jesse's super eager to get into this show tonight. <laughs> so am I, actually. It's, uh, we're going to uh, start off like usual by talking about what we did this week. So, Jesse, how about it? Um, playing with guitar soldering. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm putting the... <laughs> wow. All right, so I'm putting the little micro switches in. They are basically push pull switches on um, the volume and control, uh, volume and tone pots of my baby. And I'm still doing this. This thing's been sitting with no guts in it for like weeks. <laughs> I just kind of <laughs> play it acoustically, which as a full hollow body, it, it works pretty well, actually. Sure. Sure. But um, yeah, so I'm going at this thing, and it's like these switches, they're tiny. Mm. And it, it really points up how much practice I've, I've never done on with soldering. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, just standard pots are fine, but these little micro switches, man, oh man. So one trick that I found though, is it, it helps if you just use a solid core piece of wire, you can just, you know, hold it in place better and all this, instead of trying to use the multi strand wire and twist and tin and all this, but just these little switches, little bits that are maybe a centimeter long that you have to use to bridge little contacts on a, on a double pull, double throw, tiny switch. Mm-hmm. So um, it's coming along. It's almost wired up now. <laughs> I'm kind of actually deciding what I'll do. It's not just, you know, that, um, you know, that as far as the time goes, I have a little a tone cube, little device that I've gotten. It's like decades old, actually. It's like a passive tone thing. So I'm going to throw that in there as well, and we'll see how that goes. As far as playing goes, um, well, one thing that was kind of interesting, I couldn't sleep the other night, so I was up uh, uh, just looking at tabs and, and um, you know, chord stuff for the top 10 uh, tearjerker songs. <laughs> <laughs> a YouTube channel that does, like, top 10 whatever, guitar players, rock songs, whatever they do. And one is, like, tearjerker songs. So they had, like, um, Johnny Cash's version of Hurt. Okay. You know, had Tears in Heaven, I think, was the number one song, you know, some, like polishing up like the finger picking on some of these things because there's a lot of like acoustic based stuff you know even like the rock bands have like acoustic based stuff right so that was cool uh and that's mostly what i've been doing so how about you well before we get into me i have to say that the number one tear jerking song for me i think <laughs> has to be dust in the wind that's that such was... a depressing song yeah well two things on that two notes one um it was a runner-up actually Okay. And probably if it had, if it wasn't decades old, would have like been the top spot. The second thing is, you know, now I can't think of Dustin Wood without thinking of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe that's what will help me get over <laughs> Dustin Wood. If I could just think of Bill and Ted. Oh my. Uh, yeah, but oh, this is a sad song. Yeah, uh, Tears in Heaven's a sad song too. Don't get me wrong, and that's a few decades old, I believe, now as well. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while since. Yeah that happen so all right so let's move away because we don't want to make our audience <laughs> I, I don't want to cry nobody wants to cry so uh yeah so this week um i've been going through a very painful experience start and i actually can't say this whole week it's been really just last night and today um my instructor has sort of suggested that i start to try to learn things by ear a little bit because mm-hmm. okay? my ear is awful i am the product of the internet guitar generation where you just look up the tabs, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. We're done. All right. Now, of course, the easiest songs to probably pick up uh, by ear is to start with stuff that you know really well Mm -hmm. and doesn't have a lot of fancy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So your choices are, as my wife said, nursery rhymes or Christmas songs. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's July when we're recording this. There's no way in the world I'm going to be playing Christmas songs. Although, actually, I should take that back because if there's a genre of music I dislike the most, it may very well be nursery rhymes. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we were talking about depressing. I think we're still talking about depressing. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. So I spent a good hour 
trying to figure out um, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star by ear. I am not a fan of nursery rhymes. And I'll keep saying this over and over again, too. And row, row, row your boat, which I did figure out both. OK, it took me an hour, which honestly, a couple of years ago, last year at this time, whatever, it would take me a lot longer than that. Mm-hmm. My ear has gotten better, but it still sucks. Right. And so uh, I was trying to I, I looked up Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star on guitar. All right. That, that rhymes. But anyway, um, everything that I found was how to play. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to cheat, right? So instead, I just did Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Okay, what came up was the most nauseating, sickly sweet versions of these nursery rhymes, almost like auto tune, with on top of that these sickingly like bright kind of animation. Some were computer generated. Some of them were just some guy jumping around. I'm not, I mean, you know, I, I, the audience probably doesn't know this, but I'm not a big fan of kids' movies. So sitting through that for an hour <laughs> on top of the sickly sweet singing on these nursery rhymes, I was just, I was frying my brain. And uh, so. You know what would what, help this? Jack Daniels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. And so and my wife has an excellent ear. So to make things even more difficult on me psychologically, she'd come in and go, no, nope, that's that's not right. Uh, uh, uh. I can't, no, I can't. You know, like, my ear sucks. So so uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to see how far I can get without her today. And so I stopped work early today and um, played Itsy Bitsy Spider or tried to play Itsy. So the first thing I did, is I looked it up and I put piano as my keyword. Mm hmm. Okay. I skipped over all the instructional because I know where a C is on a guitar, right? I was going to skip over that. And I found some kid, some small kid, like I guess he's probably two or three, um, playing and his parent was sh- filming over his shoulder. And I don't know piano, so he can trust any key he wants and I don't know what it would be. Yeah. All right. And so I was listening to him play uh, over and over and over, probably for about an hour and a half. Oh, wow. Uh, trying to figure this out. And... Uh, Let's see. And my wife comes home and I said, all right, where am I on this song? It turns out I was up to the itsy bitsy spider, went up the water spout. That's all I got into. That was correct. And uh, no, yes. And that was it. The rest of the stuff, I was, I was just off. I was like the right rhythm, of course, but the notes were wrong. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just keep pushing through this stuff until I get good at it. And I'm going to start playing off of my computer through YouTube where you can slow down the music. Right. So I think if I can slow down on YouTube and listen to like one note at a time, all these one note songs, Mm -hmm. then I can hear is the pitch going up? Is the pitch going down? It's slow. I can think about it. Uh, My wife showed me how to map things out, you know, sort of pitches. And you might not know what the pitch is, but you can mark off as it going up or down, relatively speaking. Right. And just slog through learning some songs by ear. Yeah. My ear needs to get better because my ear is terrible. So here's a question. When you say you're doing it by ear, are you picking out just the melody on the guitar or are you doing chords? Just the melody. So these, these nursery rhymes are basically one note. Right. That's it. You know, it's basically the melody. Uh, I would like to try to get to chords eventually mm-hmm. and pick out something that's simple. There's a, tons of songs out there that are some permutation of GCD. Oh, yeah. I think most of the, the structure, I mean, the structure is so simple that most of them are going to be like two or three chord, you know. Right. And it's going to be some variations of one, four, five, you know. And I'm not sure if I'll ever get or necessarily um, need to get to the level of I'm dissecting solos mm-hmm. and being able to see, you know, I'm hearing the solo. And, but I'd like to be able to wrap my head around that solo by listening to it and getting a general idea of what's going on. Yeah. So it's like starting over again with the instrument. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's funny because, you know, the old – the old days before pre YouTube, it was all about ear training. In fact, I mean, musicians didn't, there really wasn't tab until the first like tab magazine came along, which was guitar for the practicing musician, which would have been like the early eighties okay. before that. I mean, there was music, but most rock players slash blues players didn't read sheet music. 
So it was all, you know, audible. People pick stuff up off of records, tapes, whatever. And we didn't have the tools. Like, like now, not only can you slow down whatever's on YouTube, but um, there's software that you can slow down whatever MP3 uh, tracks you might have. In fact, I think Winamp has a, a couple plugins you can slow down. Yeah. And there's uh, the amazing slow downer, I think it's called. And there's yep. um, Transcribe. I mean, there's a bunch of different softwares that, and I'm sure there's free versions or trial versions or whatever out there, open source things. Yeah, VLC, I think, does it. Yeah, and, you know, they all have different sort of algorithms to make the tempo slow down while not changing the pitch because that'll throw you off. Um, But yeah, so um, those are all good, uh, you know, tools to use. The other thing that you might want to do is look for, and I don't know what to recommend specifically, but some sort of like musical ear training program, software, whatever, where what they do is um, they sort of train you with intervals. Okay. So let's say here's the key of C, here's the C note, boom. What's this interval? You know, and they'll play two notes, dun, dun, you know, or dun, dun, or whatever it is. And then you have to guess what that interval is. And then your ear will start to recognize the commonly used ones in major and, and minor keys. So you'll hear a third and a fifth a stepwise, you know, a second. So, okay, between this note and that note, I know it's a fairly small interval or a big one. And then once you get that sort of mental process down, and then it just becomes really fast. Yeah. Uh, it's good. It's funny you mentioned that. And uh, listeners, if you have suggestions for the software, please let us know. Uh, post a comment, but um, musictheory.net yeah. is a good, and they have exactly that tool that you just described. They'll play a note, then you have to guess the interval. They also have, they'll play, I think, um, if I remember correctly, they'll do um, scales too mm-hmm. and play. They have a couple different exercises uh, that they have available on their website. So, yeah, I I need to buckle down on this stuff, though, and get my ear better. Yeah. That's the long and the short of it. And unfortunately, I think that's going to involve me listening to a lot of nursery rhymes uh, for a while. <laughs> you know what might be even worse for your, I don't know, PTSD traumatic <laughs> <laughs> but is really good, is uh, what they call solfeggio, which I think is uh, Italian for self-brutalization, but I don't know. And it's not. <laughs> <laughs> But basically, it's uh, sight singing. So what you would do is, you know, you have just a basic melody on staff music, and they and there's notes, you know, and they start out very simply, maybe like repeated notes with just stepwise, you know, seconds, thirds, basic notes um, for familiar um, melodies. And then you have to, like, you know, the do re mi fa sol la ti do thing from yes. um, Sound of Music. So each of those is the syllable that you use for that uh, note. You know, so if you had, you know, a fifth, you know, it would be do so, and and you'd have to read that as you, you know, say that or sing that rather. Mm -hmm. So the whole point was now you're recognizing intervals, but you're also singing what you're seeing and your ear and your brain and your voice all sort of coalesce on this, you know, interval recognition. So that when you hear that interval of a fifth on record or whatever, boom, your brain just knows. Huh. And then it translates to guitar and, and you know what a fifth looks like on a guitar, you know, right. so it's right, right. there. Um, it's a slow process, but I think that's probably the, the way to really hammer it in your head. <laughs> right. Right. You know, I think when, I, when you're, when you're, you know, when you're like, you know, do, re, mi, fa, and your wife's in the next room. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I want to subject her to my singing. That's the thing. You know, it's awful. Yeah, um, mind you, she got you started on the nursery round thing. So that is true. <laughs> it's, it's fair payback. But, you know, and the thing is, is that my ear is so bad. My, my, my pitch is so bad that I can't even sing in tune with songs. I don't even care. I don't even try. I stopped trying like 20 years ago. Um, singing along in the car. I'll sing to my heart's content in the car. Don't get me wrong, but I'm all over the place in, uh, uh, in key. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. I find after doing all this that that, that all improves. Oh, well. well just because I, that feedback loop of hearing, recognizing, singing, it's all one thing, kind of. Right. But I think that might make my wife happier. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I have to hear my horrible singing. I sound better when I sing Opeth, you know. That's right, right. <laughs> Right. There's only one genre I can sing well, and that's death metal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, so there's our uh, adventure. So listeners, if you have suggestions for us um, based on our adventures this past week, please let us know in the comments. Uh, 
Now the show topic. Now I had a planned idea of a show topic for today's show, but Jesse sent me a very interesting. <laughs> oh, no. I promise not and, to rant. <laughs> no, I, I know, and I thought, and I wrote back. I said, "No, I think ranting is okay for the show." <laughs> so here's the. I'll set this up for everybody, and then we'll let Jesse rant, and then you know I'll have some points to make. And I think this is the structure of the rest of the show. Um, this morning I woke up, I got on my email, and one of the things I got was an advertisement from Fender. And um, what they were advertising was a double cutaway uh, telly. And I thought, like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, you like the sound of a telly with the sort of the playability high on the neck, right? What you go with a double cutaway? Pretty cool. So I was like, oh, this is cool. And I sent it to Jesse. Now, what I get back from Jesse is this three-paragraph email, uh, which I think raises some really good points about why it's sad that we got excited about a double cutaway telly. So... <laughs> oh, I'm going to be so ashamed. <laughs> so from here, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Jesse, and you can uh, sort of recant, recount what you said in the email. Well, essentially, my point was, um, it was interesting, but then I thought... What's even more interesting is this should have come out in 1955. <laughs> you know, double. I mean, this is an obvious thing: double uh, cutaway Telecaster. Um, and one thing that came to mind really quickly is, you know, Telecaster is a basic guitar. They improved it, in, in my opinion, in opinion of many people, with the the version two of the electric guitar with the Stratocaster. You know, two years later. Um, but if, if people liked what's in a Telecaster, I mean, you could take an ash-bodied Strat, let's say, uh, you know, Stratocaster, because it's the improved body. You know, it's got the bevels, it's more comfortable to play, it hangs better because of the cutaway, blah, blah, blah. You put a Telecaster bridge and, pick up, and pickups in it, if that's the sound you prefer, um, but yet with a Strat middle pickup, so you have all those combinations available, you make the switching available so you have the best of both worlds, and boom, you're done. And that could have been done in the mid-50s. Mm -hmm. um, and yet here we are, <laughs> what is this, 65 years later, going, ooh, a Telecaster with double cutaway. And I'm like, <laughs> in the meantime, you look in the catalogs and all over the web and everything, and everybody's playing some variant of a Strat or a Telecaster or a Les Paul. Um, Unless you're a hollow body fan, and then there's you know different choices, although typically only a couple of those, and um, and they're all over the catalogs, and they're just out there, and and yet this is a a industry in which everybody's like, oh, but we're different. Well, what do you guys sound like? Well, we sound a little like these guys and these guys, but we're different. We're different. We're different. And yet I play a guitar that was designed in 1950 freaking two, <laughs> and an amp that was designed pretty much about the same era, um, because why? Because they're better, you know. No, I mean, is anything better than it was back then? I mean, you know, we don't drive the cars of them. We don't drive it, it, nothing, you know. And so, in the meantime, they are the most uh, successful companies, I and mean, they're all over the place. And not that they shouldn't be successful, but they shouldn't be. And here's what drove me. My favorite brand actually is Parker, which is actually a subsidiary of. I forget the name of the company, but they also own Washburn as well. And I think Parker is actually going out, you know, at least the American made ones are, are going to stop being made and they'll may have the imports or whatever. But if you're lucky over the past couple of years, you've seen like one or two Parker guitars in the catalogs. And of course, you know, your musician's friend, your other catalogs put the, the pages and pages of guitars that they do because they're paid by the manufacturers. Basically they're advertisements. That's what these catalogs are. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But Parker ha had a lot of good ideas, you know. You may or may not like the ultra thin, ultra light shred machine, you know, kind of guitar. But if you do, it was a good one. There's no reason that shouldn't be have a market, you know. Um, and it's just kind of like I, I don't know. There are some. I should say there's some successful versions of that. I mean, like Ibanez does a great business. You know, with these shred machines, you know, that, that are kind of similar. Um, but, you know, we lose out when we have such all these variants of just these very basic old ideas. And whenever something new comes out um, and you see it sometimes, you know, you see new new hardware de designs, new pickup designs, new uh, body materials, either non-traditional woods or even not even woods. There's all kinds of, you know, 
uh, carbon graphite and and other kind of uh, materials that that companies try to use, but everybody backs away from. Them. Oh, that's that's no good. That's not good because why? Tradition basically mm-hmm. is not wood. That's not all of it. I know that because you know some of these things are more expensive to make than you know take a piece of wood through a router. And, you know, right, right. But um. But yeah, so in, in an industry where everybody seems to pride themselves on being new and different and unique and blah, 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 and they play the same old stuff, you know, even pickups where it's like, you know, the difference is in, in single coil pickups between, you know, this noiseless design or that, you know, regular design or just a little hotter version of that. Everybody makes a big deal about these little, little teeny differences that like were almost pretty much within the winding specification differences in the old day anyway. Right. You get two pickups that weren't anything alike because just the, there's some old lady counting the windings, you know, or whatever. And so it's like, I don't know, man. It's like, <sighs> is there is there any room for guitar innovation? I, well, that's a good question. Or is the guitar a solved problem? Well, that that's a very good point. I mean, it, it yeah. depends on your your sort of point of view. And I mean, mm-hmm. I'm even coming from point of view of a guy who doesn't even have a seven string guitar, let alone an eight, let alone a Chapman stick or anything that's right. really you know uh, different. So I, maybe I'm being hypocritical about the whole thing. You know, that's possible um, because that's where my comfort level is. You know, <laughs> but um, it could be. Um, at some point, it's like, well, how high does your note need to be? How low? How many notes in a chord? Particularly if you're going to have distortion, you don't want seven or eight note chords anyway right right um so yeah though I, I don't know it's um some of the things i think are just different would be good you know different sounds different pickup structures or, or placement or you know uh, i don't know show me new things i mean i like really light and really efficient uh, basically i want the guitar to not even be there Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if I could have like a holographic, you know, finger sensing thing, you know, where it's like I could play a guitar that's not even there. That's what I would want <laughs> <laughs> because it just kind of gets in the way between brain finger sound, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and so I like light, thin, slim, you know, kind of because to my touch, that's that's, you know, what gets in the way the least. Sure. But there are people I'm sure who like, yeah, you know what? I like to feel this big honking instrument that I'm working around. I, I, that's fine, you know. And, and I think I lean more towards that. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a less I'm a fairly heavy Les Paul player as of late, mm-hmm. and I and I have sort of leaned towards. I like to feel that body's there. I feel right. like I'm playing. The neck is a little thicker. I like that because I'm something to grab onto. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and so there are different tastes, but. I mean, you know, this whole idea of innovation, we can go back to the, the guitar that's trying to point, it's hard to point backwards, right there, <laughs> all right? And for those of you that are on audio, I'm pointing to my SG. Uh, you know, and that came out in, like, I guess, what, 61? 60, 61? Mm-hmm. Uh, that was to completely replace the Les Paul, if I understand correctly. Mm-hmm. And it didn't pan out. Les Paul himself didn't like the guitar, is a story that I've been told, and so they brought that body shape back. Right. You know, but the idea from what I understand the story to be is that that was supposed to be the new Les Paul. Right. Right. Yeah. And and it just didn't go over well. And I think there's a history of guitarists being kind of traditional. Sure. Oh, I think that's true. I mean, of course, that's true in, in almost any industry. And, sort, of course, there were people who didn't even like the electric guitar. I mean, well, that's not a real guitar because you plug it in. I mean, certainly your classical players like Segovia have said disparaging things about, you know, <laughs> electrified guitars. Right. Um, but, I mean, that goes throughout, you know, genres or, or, you know, style of manufacture, whatever. But it's always a mix. You're going to have Luddites and mm-hmm. then you're going to have forward thinking people. And, of course, my thinking was, well, if the – if at least one school of thought was to um, – sleekify and and make a guitar more comfortable and more you know organic that way or whatever um to go from telecaster to stratocaster which i think succeeded in a lot of those things mm-hmm. then the logical progression to that would be to go to something like an ibanez saber or radius or to call it the, the satriani model rather um where they're even smaller, even lighter, rounder or thinner or, you know what I mean? And and I think the Parker of all the things I've played is, is the culmination of that way of thinking. Right. You know, right. I mean, it's like there's, it's as close to, there's nothing there as you can get with like wood and metal and, you know, those sort of things. Right. Um, 
And so I'm thinking, where did that school thought go that this company can't succeed? You know, I mean, is it because nobody's interested in that school? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So I guess the question is, suppose we get like, uh, I don't know, carbon fiber. All mm -hmm. right. And, with, and that can bring down to be brought down to the price of wood. Right. OK. Um, is there going to be a shift of people who are going to basically say, oh, well, carbon fiber guitars, that's that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. Right. Or will carbon fiber not have any opportunity to market because it's not wood? Well, I, I, there's going to be, that's a good question. And I think, yeah. um, like, now I, having said all this, um, my acoustic guitars are composite acoustic guitars, which are made of carbon fiber. And I absolutely love them because they do not, they have, they don't move in the weather. Okay. I don't have to adjust the truss rod. In fact, there is no truss rod to adjust. They mm -hmm. just are. So summer, winter, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, I, I hear you can leave it in the car trunk in the summer and it's you know, fine, you know. Now there's places that are glued still, and so there's things that might be affected by that. So right. I, I've never done it. Um, but the, and the biggest deal, I think, at least in my mind, is that they are more expensive, okay. Um, I don't think they're of the quality level. I don't think they're more expensive than a commensurate tailor or something that would be a high-quality wooden guitar or a Martin or, you know, name it. Um, but they do think, and see the examples I give you is the traditional classic, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Should have said Larivee or Collings or something. But anyway, um, but there, there, so there isn't a $300 acoustic made of carbon fiber. If there were, it's a good question as to what it would become. Um, I, there are people though, even at the higher price level who are looking at a, a $1,500 guitar, $2,000 guitar that, will say, no, nah, I'm not interested in car. I won't even listen to it. Right. Plenty of people on the forums are like, yes, I was that until I heard it. Yeah. And then, you know, and I think it sounds every bit as good as a wood one. They are, they are slightly different. But then that brings up the question of, well, what should a guitar sound like? Right. Should it sound like a wooden steel string guitar? Because they didn't 300 years ago. You're right. Playing a lute or a cat got thing or whatever. Um, what will they sound like in 100 years? I don't know. Well, they even have the same form factor, the same, you know, know. what will it be? And, and or, or will people basically say, no, I want the, you know, the ash body or I want the, you know, the cap or whatever, you know, and, and if it's not wood, it's not a guitar. Well, and that's true. And I can, yeah. I guess I can understand there, there are various ways of thinking about that. Um you know, it's like it's real. I can feel this connection to the wood and all this through the layers of polyurethane that it's finished with. Let's <laughs> not go there. <laughs> right. right. But uh, yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of ways of thinking. I'm just thinking, though, that in, in the huge market that, that there is, um, I'm surprised that there isn't enough of any one of these schools to sort of support at least a couple manufacturers that are going a certain way. You know, I mentioned this, it's it, the composite acoustics. I mean, they were their own company. Now PV owns the, the name um, and bought them, which was nice because otherwise they would have been out of business as well. And there are other, um, you know, Rain Song and Emerald and other um, composite acoustic guitar makers. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, the lack of sort of variety is... I don't know. I mean, there is no lack of variety. There's tons of it, but, but everything seems to be, it's like a bell curve where everybody's going for these traditional things and the right. bits on the ends are just sort of much smaller than I would have expected. Well, and even we have said things like Strat copy, Tele copy, less, you know, LP copy or LP clone, you know, that's true. And, and it's just the, the terminology of the, um, of the market. Yeah. Right. And if it's not one of those three things, then it, it stands out as being different. And it may not necessarily be a good thing when it comes to sales. That's true. You know, because people don't know what it is. Yeah, I guess that's true. You know, you know and, and, and there is a certain amount of um, safety in mm -hmm. the tried and true. I mean, I know when yeah. you first get into guitar, I, I don't even know what I want. But so what do you do? You pick one that your favorite player plays. Maybe you'll pick one that you've seen a lot of in a guitar. So, if it, it, okay, I know a Strat shape is an electric guitar. And so I have no idea what to pick. So that is comforting. Right. Or a Les Paul or something you've seen just in so many different, you know, venues. Um, 
So yeah, I don't know. I get kind of existential about this stuff. No, no, I think this is actually a, it's a good topic. It's it's uh, you know sort of what's the state of guitardom, if you will, yeah. right now in terms of what's available. And you know, we could have a similar conversation about amps. Oh, absolutely. You know, and you know why this attachment to the tube amp, right? Right. Um, and, and some people, they feel very strongly that the tube is the better sound over the solid state. And certainly when we've been amp shopping together, we've played these modeling amps. And there's a there is a difference between, you know, a modeled Fender Twin and an actual Fender Twin. But is one better? You know, it's personal. Oh, it's true. And it's personal. funny because, it well, yeah, and. It's like, you know, when I get on pickup forms and I'm reading what people think about things, I mean, there are some people who actually prefer a noisy pickup. You know, they'll get a strap with, even to the point of not having a reverse wound middle pickup so that two of those five positions are noise can canceling. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, the noise is part of the sound. I mean, okay. they'll yeah. actually say, and it's like, it, it's part of the 1954 sound because you had no other choice. But that's almost like saying, I specifically like records because of the crackle and the noise. You know what right. I mean? Right. And it's like, if you really think that, fine. Don't think that it's better or that it's more accurate or any of that. Sure. Now, guitar is a creative medium, not a recreative one. So it's different. I mean, you, you, the sound is new. You're creating it. So it's not all about accuracy anymore anyway. Right. But my thinking is, it's freaky annoying. <laughs> this noise is like, well, why? <laughs> when you don't have to, you know? And so what most people do is, well, if I can get a noise-free setup, that is, um, you know, the same sound or close to it or whatever. I mean, that's sort of the goal for many. But then it's like, well, there's a lot of different sounds out there, too, that are, that are very different um, and truthfully, you know, these the pickup makers will, will go and do things that are not traditional, you know, usually extremes. So we're going to go for something really high output that does right. whatever a really high output pickup will do or something really clean or something active, you know, preamps or whatever they do. Um, but there's a lot of things that you, or the piezoelectric, you know, that that's one of the nice things that's become kind of big where they put the piezo pickup in an electric guitar bridge to either be mixed in or so that you can make it sort of sound like sort of an acoustic guitar since the what we've now become you know we think an acoustic guitar sounds like is a piezoelectric pickup right because you hear that at concerts or whatever right right uh, here's a clue it's really not <laughs> that's right but you know close enough and you can right. sort of get that with electric but it's like all right what about like new sounds that you can do with you know pickups and there's all kinds of different designs you can see you know q tuner or, you know um but i don't know what what is the deal should it be because whatever it's going to be, the differenter you make it, the less able it is to sound like the stuff you grew up with. Right. The familiar and the comforting. and Yeah. And we've said this on the show. And for our listeners who've been with us for a while, you know, we've, we've, heard, we've said this many times. It's about chasing the sound you want to make. That's true. Right? There's no better. There's no right. There's no wrong. It's what is it that you, you want to make? I think one of the really cool innovations um, that are out there are the um, Fender does this with the strats. They have the little cards that yeah. you can swap in and out and you can basically have different pickups based on what card um, you put into the guitar. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a cool innovation that I would like to see more of, more of the blending of the electronic or I should say the digital with the guitar. Yeah. And now some of the people will be like, oh, no, you know, that's like the exact wrong direction. And we want to have this, you know, classic. Well, we talked about the 50 sound or whatever. And that's perfectly fine. There's space right. for those folks, too. But I, you know, I think it'd be kind of cool to sort of take your guitar, um, get on the computer, download your pickup configuration, mm -hmm. put the card into the guitar. And if I want to sound like, um, you know, Dimebag Daryl. Then what I've got on that card is a you know I don't know B tuning and uh, and I'm often running with that particular sound, a really aggressive sound or whatever the case might be. Uh, so I'd love to see more of that, um, and maybe the technology of the DSP isn't quite there yet. Right. I don't know, but it would be I think a really interesting avenue to to chase down with the guitars, it's ultra modern, ultra convenient. And uh, whatever body style you like. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's right. Whatever 
different body style elements, uh, materials, just, just have at it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's true. Maybe that's where we're, we're ending up. And again, it's not that people haven't, you know, reached for this, you know, over the past. Cause I mean, you know, you've seen guitars. I'm sure if you look back and even as early as like the seventies, BC rich had those guitars with like 12 switches on it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. See these? I mean, I think that's why their body styles were so big. Cause they need a place to put all those switches, you know? Right. Um, so you had every phase and now, uh, you know, coil tap and coil everything. Um, which was a control nightmare. And I think Fender's idea of, okay, so you put this card in, it gives you a certain number of sounds that with a more simplified switching arrangement you can do, but they're your choices that we're, you know, putting on this more simplified arrangement. That's, that's kind of a good compromise. Um, and of course, I don't know exactly what they're doing with the cards. Actually, I should find out a little more. Uh, they're pre-programmed cards. I don't think that there's software involved. Uh, I would love to see software involved where you can program the cards yourself. Right. Right. And we have a little USB device that you put the card in, you download, you got your sound, you plug it in. Uh, but these are, uh, from what I understand, they're the pre-programmed cards. And I think you get three of them with the Stratocaster. Mm -hmm. And that's just a range of... of uh, um, sounds that you get out of these pickups. So these are, are kind of pre-wiring, like uh, wiring matrix matrices, sort of. So, you know, from what I've seen of them, and I, and I have to say, I'm not super familiar with them. They almost remind me of Nintendo cartridges. Really? But they're not the plastic housing. It's like right. the actual card that was in the um, the cartridge. I guess my question is: Is there something electronic actually going on, or is it just a switching thing where? Fender gives you um, because there are aftermarket things that we'll do what I'm about to describe that every coil in now Strat's fairly simple but let's say you have a more complicated you know humbucker single coil humbucker guitar and Ibanez has these all over the place right sure um, each one of those five coils you can have individual access to both pulses north and south of each coil and you could hypothetically just wire it, every one of those into its own sort of pad on a um, a switching setup and then have a little thing that's programmed to give you, okay, you're going to have five different sounds. What five do you want of any coil going with any other combination of coil in any phase configuration or whatever, you know, so you could get out of that right. any single coil, any humbucker or any combination, but you'd have to choose however many combinations you, you want. Right. If they're doing something like that, but in a very simplified, you know, cartridge sort of system i mean that'd be awesome i think it's more than that i think it's something digital going on yeah i think but you know don't quote me on that listeners go check it out for yourself if you're not familiar with it or post a comment post a comment on our video and uh, on youtube or post a review and say you know what these guys need to learn more about these fender guitars you know just, just post a review on itunes any review helps us at all you don't just, need to say that because we already know that right that's we'll right we to do our homework and next time we'll be a little more well <laughs> we're not going to do our homework here we're we joking our listeners know this we're gonna this is this is fly by the seat of the past podcast here <laughs> so well i think with that i think we'll go ahead and wrap things up um follow us on twitter at sst show um send me an email chris at gestercat.com um you know drop us a line tell us what you think how we're doing post a review on itunes post a comment on uh youtube whatever you like to do just let us know we'd love to hear from everyone and if you have questions for us we'd be more than happy to attempt to address questions that are guitar related Definitely. um or heck even general life related questions why <laughs> not you know sure. that's right whatever so just 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 get involved you know send us some messages um, and just keep having fun. And until next time, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at jestercat.com. You can also email the show at sst at jestercat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 